Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Melissa Fratkin. I am the Industry Programs Director for the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, and welcome to our, uh, our talk this morning. Uh, first, let me thank our sponsor, Dell Technologies, uh, Dell EMC. Um, and uh, let me introduce our speaker. John Towns holds two appointments at NCSA. He has more titles than, uh, more words in his titles than anyone I know. Uh, he is the Executive Associate Director for Engagement at NCSA, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is also the Deputy CIO for Research IT in the Office of CIO at Illinois. He is also the PI and Project Director for the NSF-funded Exceed Project, which is Extreme Science and Engineering Discovery Environment. Uh, he provides leadership and direction in the development, deployment, and operation of advanced computing resources and services in support of a broad range of research activities. In addition, he is the founding chair of the steering committee of PERC, which is the Practice and Experience in Advanced Research Computing Conference, which is coming up this July. Um, he, um, and he earned his MS in Physics and Astronomy from the University of Illinois and a BS in Physics from the University of Missouri at Arola. Uh, and it is now time for John to come and talk about the COVID consortium. Thanks, Melissa, uh, and thank you everyone for, for having me here to talk about this. Uh, I'm, I'm actually very happy to have a chance to, to share what's been going on uh, in this space and, and my involvement in it over the almost year now. Uh, we're coming up on a first anniversary of starting this consortium. So um, just to, to go straight into it, um, the High Performance Computing Consortium was formed last year as a part of the response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And the notion really was to bring uh, advanced research computing capabilities to bear on the problem uh, in a variety of ways. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, about those uh, means in which we're, we're applying these resources. <clears throat> but it was originally formed as a, a public-private uh, uh, partnership uh, involving uh, a number of uh, groups, both in the federal government and industry and a lot of academic uh, cont contributors to this. Um, and, and really with the goal of advancing the pace in which we're uh, addressing uh, the pandemic. And we've done a number of things over the time, but I think one of the more, one of the most impressive things that happened during our experience is that we stood this up very, very rapidly. Uh, so this is a, a sort of the early timeline of what occurred in the establishment of the High Performance Computing Consortium uh, for COVID-19. Uh, I myself was involved, first involved in this, I think on March 18th, uh, of last year. And by Sunday, uh, a few days later, we had stood up uh, the infrastructure in order for us to accept proposals from uh, really anyone who, who wished to propose work in this space, uh, to review them and then to, to assign them to resources that were being provided by our many partners that exist within the consortium. So it, it was uh, set up in a, in a dramatically, um, a very fast uh, uh, means. And within the first few days, we had our first proposal submitted. And within the first four days of, of the consortium's existence, we had a first project up and running on, on resources. Uh, and as you can see in this timeline, we had a lot of proposals early on, as you might expect, that's tailed down a little bit, but we're still uh, receiving proposals from, from the community and continuing to review and, and make available resources for, for their work. Uh, this slide is a little bit longer timeline. Um, I won't go over this one in detail because it is something of an eye chart, but I think, uh, my, the materials, my slides will be available. So if you want to look at this a little closer um, in, uh, uh, after the presentation, welcome to do so. And of course, I'm always happy to answer any questions about it. Um, <clears throat> the, the consortium consists of 43 members and represent over 600 petaflops of computing, 165,000 nodes, 6.8 million cores, and 50,000 GPUs. Uh, and as you might imagine, GPUs are a very popular resource uh, in, in the community for a lot of the work that's being done. Uh, many of uh, many of the, the projects involve uh, AI techniques and the use of GPUs is, is very uh, key in that space. Here's our set of, of members and our affiliates. So you can see that it is a, a very broad set of, uh, of participants that span academia, federal agencies, industry, um, and we have some international participants in this, which came in a little bit later. Uh, and we're, we're very happy to, to build those international partnerships because we do accept proposals from anyone around the world. And we have supported uh, work from uh, those starting from uh, uh, work from uh, folks coming from uh, a number of different countries 
Uh, and using the collaborations that have existed through some of our pre-existing arrangements, it has helped uh, facilitate the support of those, those activities as they've been uh, executing their, their work. Uh, this is a, a snapshot off of uh, the, home, uh, the the primary website for the COVID-19 HPC Consortium. Um, you can see that we actually we have now 98 projects that are active uh, up on the consortium. I should have grabbed another screenshot this morning uh, to update that. And uh, the, the website has a lot of information about the projects that we are supporting uh, and their progress. There are many updates from uh, the various projects that are posted there so you can get a, a sense of of the, the progress that's being made, the type of work that's being done. Uh, and you can reach out to these folks. Uh, one of the real uh, key purposes of, of providing uh, information about these projects is so that others in the community uh, would have an a, ability to identify work that's going on and, and build collaborations. Uh, it's been one of the key activities of, of the consortium beyond making resources and services available to, to, to researchers to facilitate the collaborations amongst uh, various researchers in the community who may or may not know each other uh, prior to this work. The, uh, the consortium is uh, overseen by an executive board chaired by Dario Gill, who's a director of research at IBM. Uh, and the executive director of that is Barb uh, Helland at, at DOE. And you can see a number of uh, you know, the members that have participated in this and provided uh, the high level oversight and guidance uh, to uh, the activities of the consortium. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on various pieces of this, but uh, I, I think one of the things I wanted to make sure it was clear is we really do have a very broad set of representation in this at a, at a fairly high level. Uh, some of the folks who are actually participating in the conference are, are listed here as well. Uh, so they're quite uh, familiar with what's going on, but I don't think in general, this community is aware of what's what's been happening in, in this particular space. <clears throat> so, um, Again, with the intent of trying to accelerate a response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we have established this uh, proposal process uh, so that, that researchers can submit their, their, uh, their project ideas to the consortium. Uh, they're reviewed by a, a scientific review subcommittee that I chair. Um, that initially was meeting three times a week. We've backed that down a little bit since uh, the proposal submission rate has, has uh, tailed off a little bit. Uh, but since there is, uh, all of this is done through um, no formal structure or agreements. So we've created this ad hoc review committee and then we've had to create another committee that is representative of all the resources that are being made available to the community to help match those projects up that have, that have passed the scientific review <clears throat> in order to match them up to the resources that are being provided by our various provider members. Uh, this has worked very efficiently for us. Um, again, you saw we had initial projects up within days of, of establishing uh, the consortium. Uh, and for researchers, if, if you know researchers that, that are trying to work in this space and they're challenged with, uh, with having the resources and services to support it, I encourage you to share this information. So there's the, the primary uh, website for the consortium, which is listed here on the right of the slide. But um, below that is the, the link for proposal submissions, which provides guidance to uh, PIs on, on how to develop their proposal submissions. It's a very lightweight process. We try to make it as lightweight as possible. Proposals are only three pages in length. Um, and so really this is all about trying to, to make those um, resources and services available very quickly and allow, allow rapid progress uh, with our projects. <clears throat> Here's a, a, the status of the number of projects we've seen uh, thus far. So we've, we've approved 98 projects. Uh, again, my first slide wasn't uh, uh, updated on this. We approved 98. We did have a few that came in that were returned without review. Those are ones that were incomplete submissions um, and we got no further response from the, from the proposers. Uh, but you can see that um, uh, we've had 167 eligible for review. So the success rate is somewhere between 50 and 60%, depending on how you wanna measure it against total submissions or those that are eligible. So it is uh, a little bit um, careful in, in uh, making sure that we aren't just making resources available to people who don't have well-defined projects. Um, and in particular, projects that have a, a well-defined path to have uh, a near-term impact on managing the pandemic. Um, we've seen proposals from both, as I said, inside and outside the U.S., uh, and they span universities, medical organizations, companies, uh, or the organizations. So it's a pretty broad swath of, of, um, of sources of where the, the proposals are coming from. 
And then um, we've taken a look at, at these proposals to make sure that uh, at least many of them, it's very appropriate that they have um, in their plans connections to bring uh, their results in into um, into a, a means that will effectively uh, or effectively help to address uh, the pandemic. So 32% of these projects delineated plans for say, if they're doing um, small molecule design to try and identify uh, identify vaccines. Uh, they have a connection to an experimental lab that can synthesize those and do testing. Uh, and that's been very important in, in making sure that these uh, proposals can have an, a near-term effect uh, on the pandemic. We also sort of broke uh, the types of projects that we're receiving up into different groups. Uh, so and you can see them listed here, but it's basic science group, uh, which typically has involved a lot of uh, molecular dynamics types of simulations. Uh, but some other types as well, uh, and the th therapeutic development, so uh, drug design and small molecule, molecule design, drug repurposing, that's been a very interesting space um, where folks are taking previously approved FDA drugs and identifying whether the, their, what their effect, efficacy might be against the virus. Um, that provides a fast path to getting those things out as, as uh, treatments. And then on the other side of things, when you're actually treating patients and trying to make sure that uh, personal protective equipment is in the places where it needs to be, that ventilators are where they need to be, um, looks at not only the supply chain, but what is the projected spread of the virus in, in various areas. And we've supported a number of projects that are modeling um, at, at community, um, regional, state, uh, national levels, uh, the, the epidemiology of, of, of uh, the pandemic. So. There's been a, a quite a range of things uh, that are being supported by the, the consortium to date, and they've uh, provided a lot of very uh, interesting outcomes, and I'll talk about those a little bit towards the end. <clears throat> Another really important part that um, we put in place uh, a bit after the start of the, the consortium was a recognition that we needed to get um, these researchers together to exchange ideas. And so we established in, in conjunction with uh, uh, collaborators in Europe, uh, this international HPC knowledge exchange the, uh, that has been led largely by Sean Brown uh, and Kill Blood at PSC, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and Bob Sinkovitz at San Diego Supercomputing Center. Um, these are all partners in the Exceed project. So every uh, every month they're getting uh, researchers together to present on progress. Uh, this is an open uh, an open exchange. So if you if you are, have an interest or you know researchers who have an interest. Um, they're encouraged to to reach out and uh, follow this link to this uh, to the page for them. Um, one of the things that I personally will say was most interesting about this is that uh, typically uh, researchers are very reluctant to share results that they have until they at least have a preprint in place. But researchers in this case have been quite open about sharing the results. They will say, "Hey, this hasn't been uh, released as a preprint as yet, so please uh, treat it accordingly." And there's been uh, a great deal of mutual respect in, in honoring that, but also uh, the open sharing that I've noticed in, and observed in these meetings has been pretty impressive uh, and, and very atypical for what we typically see in the, uh, the, the research space. So this has been a really effective um, means of, of uh, sharing results across groups. Uh, most recently, and, and that reflected here, is that um, our colleagues in Japan have also joined this and and, uh, and we'll be participating in, in the upcoming uh, instances of the, of the knowledge exchange. Um, I will say that one of the reasons that we were able to put this together is because um, the Exceed project here in the U.S. that I run and Trace, which is a, a, a near analog in, in Europe, many may be familiar with that, we have a memo of uh, understanding and that supports exactly this sort of work. So we were able to establish this immediately without having to build government to government relationships between the US federal government and um, the European Commission uh, to, to in order to do these things. So we're able to take advantage of, of existing uh, organ, organizational relationships and, and move this forward rapidly. This is true of a number of things and, and part of, I'm not really highlighting Exceed's role in, in this, but I can talk about that more if folks want, uh, but it's, Exceed has played a, a couple of very key roles in, in being able to enable uh, the consortium to move forward rapidly. So um, early on in, in the um, 
in the process, we were receiving a lot of proposals that were focused on basic science, uh, trying to understand the virus and its characteristics, how it interacts, uh, what the protein interactions look like, uh, particularly around the, the spike protein. Um, and as we have moved forward, we've, we've transitioned to what we call phase two uh, of the consortium, which is really focusing more on therapeutics and patient care, uh, uh, especially given the existence of, of an emergence of vaccines at this point in time. Uh, that focus is more appropriate to have a more immediate impact. The other thing that's been happening and, and really one of the purposes of the, the consortium uh, is that the various agencies that support this kind of work, NIH and, and others, have started to release uh, their programmatics that support research in this space. So the consortium was really a, as a means of shortcutting a lot of that in order to move very rapidly. But as those pro programmatics come in place from the agencies, we're, we're trying to back away from that. That's really the appropriate way for these things to be done. Uh, but in a crisis, you need to work uh, quickly and react uh, fast. So uh, the consortium was, was facilitating that. So you see here are the sorts of things that we're focusing on uh, more at this point in time uh, with respect to the types of projects we're interested in seeing. Um, and, and then uh, we've also uh, thought about this uh, in a larger context. Um, we've been able to do a lot of uh, a lot of work with a lot of researchers very rapidly, uh, but we recognize that um, this current pandemic is not the only one that we've seen in in recent years, and there are other types of crises that can benefit um, in how the nation responds to them by having uh, these sorts of resources and services available to researchers. So not just pandemics, but um, natural disasters, uh, man-made disasters, and other things that that, that occur. And so based on that, we have um, we have responded to a, a request for information that was issued by uh, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy um, in December that looks at, at ideas for something uh, called the National Strategic Computing Reserve, which would be a standing resource uh, similar to things like the Merchant Marines or uh, Civil Air Defense uh, that, that this country maintains. Those may not be things that you're familiar with, but uh, they are standing resources that are available or response. Um, and this would be an analog in bringing these sorts of um, capabilities to bear on crises that, that emerge. So uh, um, that is an ongoing process. Uh, we responded to that solicitation and we're waiting for um, the report from the Office of Science and Technology Policy to be issued. Uh, we expect that's coming in the next month or so uh, to see what the next steps might be. This is a long-term process. Establishing something like this uh, for the country will take a several years, and this is very early in that process, but um, I think it would create capabilities that would allow us to be much more responsive in the nation to the sorts of crises that, that are similar to the sorts of things that we've seen with this pandemic. Um, I did want to at least uh, show a little bit of science here. Uh, so what I've got here in the next few slides, and I'm not going to go into them in detail because I really don't have time for that, but um, uh, there's a number of what we've been doing is trying to, to select some of the most impactful work that's that's come out of uh, the projects that we've supported in the consortium. So you see three examples here in the basic science range uh, uh, realm. Uh, uh, again, so you understand the basics of of the, of the protein structure and, and how it interacts uh, both with other proteins and with uh, with cell membranes. Uh, these sorts of things um, in the therapeutic and vaccine uh, development space. Um, another set of projects uh, that are really trying to identify candidates uh, for screening and testing. Uh, there's been a lot of work done uh, in this space and it's, there's been a number of interesting results as you can see summarized here. Uh, and again, all of these things are, um, are also noted on the consortium's uh, main website under its projects list. And then finally, in the, the patient level projects that we've, that we've been supporting, um, understanding transmission models um, and uh, various other aspects of this. The, the last one uh, uh, by uh, Sam Dutta is actually one that personally made me a little concerned because it really brought home what it means uh, when you're in an enclosed space with others, uh, being exposed to the to uh, to the virus and its particles that are airborne at the time. Um, it's uh, it's pretty uh, enlightening to to take a look at that. So I encourage you to to look at the uh, the website to see some of the work that's been done. Um, 
And so uh, I, I know I don't have a whole, didn't have a whole lot of time for this. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. I just wanted to summarize again. We were we were really about trying to bring these these capabilities to advance uh, uh, our ability to to uh, fight the pandemic. Um, it's been an interesting uh, group, uh, again spearheaded by the White House through the Office of Science and Technology Policy Department of Energy and IBM, but with many other partners as I as I listed previously. One of the things that's been so amazing to me about all of this is that there are no formal agreements in place, as I mentioned previously. Um, uh, and so we've been working on good faith amongst uh, this large collection of folks and it's worked quite well. Uh, it is another reason why we've also thought about this National Strategic Computing Initiative because having those things in place would facilitate and, and deal with some of the challenges that we've had to address by not having a lot of these agreements in place. Um, and so, uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think there's maybe a couple of questions that, that have come in in the chat, and I'll try and address those as they, as they come. So uh, you're muted, Melissa. Ah, I'm muted. Okay. So that was really cool. Um, I knew a little bit about it because tax is part of it, but uh, it's, it's amazing to see how quickly it all came together and, and what's happened. The one thing you did not mention uh, is who's paying for all this? How, where is the funding coming from? Um, that's a great question um, because there is no formal funding for this. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, uh, there's no formal agreements either, uh, but all of the participants are, are volunteering their resources, their, their staff time. There's a lot of staff time involved in this. So as the PI for Exceed, um, NSF has allowed us to, to make use of our staff time and also uh, other NSF funded resources to be allocated in these ways. This is uh, done the same from both the government labs uh, and uh, and also from the industry partners that have provided resources. So everyone is volunteering all of this. It's been that has been an amazing part of this, really. So that that brings up a related question uh, from Kenneth Hosty. Is there any concern about malicious actors trying to get access and use the power of these powerful systems for, you know, denial of service or mining Bitcoin or whatever? Are they just, is that not happening? Um, as anybody who who's works in that space knows, it's always hard to combat these things. Um, it is part of the reason why we have the review process to, to, to check the validity of, of the, the work that they're proposing. So often those that um, are trying to um, exploit systems in those ways actually don't know the science very well. So they can't uh, submit a cogent proposal. <laughs> so they can't even fake it. They can't fake it too easily. And now at the same time, these things do happen. All of the folks that are operators of these resources are quite familiar with these sorts of challenges and have their own mechanisms for monitoring such things uh, on their resources. So um, this is what I would call one of the, the places where we don't have the sort of integration that we would like because a bunch of volunteers have come together and we have to rely on their local capabilities. Many of them are quite competent, so I'm, I'm not really worried about that, but we don't have easy mechanisms to collaborate on such issues. So do we really think the National Strategic Computing uh, Resource Initiative is gonna happen? Do we have a timeline um, on that? Uh, that Again, it's still very early in that process. Um, and so uh, this uh, request for information, the RFI that was issued, uh, did get the number of submissions in the community. Uh, and uh, there's a, a long legislative process that this would have to go through. Um, first, it will require support um, in Congress, and then it would require uh, funds to support it. Uh, I expect this is a three to five year uh, effort mm -hmm. to get something in place. Uh, when we look at how other reserves have been put in place, uh, it's often taken uh, that time scale to, to get them in place. So uh, we understand that going in uh, and the consortium in its current form will, will be done uh, well before that, that, that time comes. Uh, but there's a group of folks who are interested in trying to, to establish this so that the country can better respond to such things. Well, thank you, sir. It was really interesting. Um, and it's not often I see someone else on screen who can, uh, you know, has the kind of curls that I have, although you have way more than I do, which is amazing. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, John's slides will be available later. Um, there was a question about um, the aerosol project because that one, when you linked it, didn't have a link to it. But I bet if you go to the COVID consortium, you'll be able to find it. 
That's correct. If you go to that uh, uh, website, you'll be able to find that project and, and see more details. Great. Well, then our time is up and I will pass it off to Earl Joseph, who is the moderator for the next panel.